Devon Woodland, president of National Farmers, is here today to talk about an NFO plan to isolate the National Grain Reserve the way Congress originally intended. Just like any other stockpile, the purpose is to have the commodity available for strategic reasons and to isolate it from the normal market to keep it from destroying the price. Mr. Woodland tells what happened to the grain reserve. Since we live in a world of political and economic compromise, the USDA made an almost immediate concession. That is, reserves could also be stored off the farm in approved warehouses. Now, some farmers shuddered at this, recalling earlier days when unscrupulous warehousemen collected storage on vacant buildings. In any event, the grain was still visible, not just available under low price conditions. In fact, there was a stiff penalty if the growers sold the grain when markets were below 140% of loan. Once the market moved to 140% of loan on a national average, growers could sell the grain without penalty. The rules of the reserve also stated that when the market reached 175% of the original level, the Commodity Credit Corporation had to be paid off, but not necessarily by selling the grain. If the grain farmer in the reserve had the financial resources otherwise, he could just pay. Suddenly, the idea started to darken. First grain could be moved, regardless of price, if it was going out of condition. What did this mean? That the professional farmer or warehouseman couldn't care for the reserve? Then any grower could move reserve if he replaced it within 30 days with new crop. So these specific bushels, in fact, were not really and truly isolated. Finally, Congress dealt the reserve protection its final blow by squeezing the release and call price levels together. No more maneuvering. And it added up to be a ceiling on the market. The nightmare was now complete. We were back to the 1960s. Woodland takes note of where we are now with this reserve, which has been monkeyed with, and what can be done about it. If the reserve isn't a nightmare, certainly it has become a hoax, with the rules changing almost overnight like the recent change in rules allowing a 60-day rotation period. Our plan is to isolate the reserve once and for all behind one voice, one voice which will ensure that it goes into an upmarket and makes reserve call prices the floor and not the ceiling. Devon Woodland, president of National Farmers, discussing NFO's plan on the grain reserve. Today we're going to present Ray Jurgison, Director of Operations for the Grain Department of National Farmers. He has an important and timely message for all producers of grain in the United States. Ray Jurgison. Phil, the Grain Department of National Farmers really would want all growers to carefully consider the ramifications of shipping grain under price later or no price established agreements, sometimes called consignment grain or deferred pricing. Essentially, the terms of the agreement are that the grower gives up title to the grain and receiver then sends it on down uh, the pipeline somewhere. Well, what advantages do these no price or price later agreements give to the buyer? Well, the buyer or receiver of uh, no price established grain has every advantage because it gives the buyer a supply that he needs uh, without bidding for it, without competing for it, without chasing after it. In other words, he gets what uh, the grain he needs uh, to fill his contracts or to uh, ship in uh, to export position and has never had to go out into the market and seek the grain. Just gets the grain right from the grower because the grower has given up title. Some aspects of this are pretty surprising. How widespread are these agreements? As near as we can tell, the agreements are available in almost every grain producing county in the United States. Well, what in the world would make a grain producer enter into such an agreement? Well, I think that uh, haven't, uh, the producers haven't studied it carefully enough, Phil. On the surface, the grower thinks that he's getting the grain off the farm because perhaps he doesn't have enough storage, is getting it out of the way, and it's a convenient uh, option for him to get the grain out of the way. It would be kind of like John Deere Company having a big inventory of combines and just taking them around the county and distributing them to the farmers and saying, look, we'll give up title to these combines. You fellows go ahead and use them, and we'll come out and price them later based on whatever you'll bid for them. Well, now supposing that uh, a grain grower enters into one of these price-later agreements, what options would he then have left? 
Well, actually, Phil, once the grower has entered a no-price established agreement, he loses all options. He only has one choice left, and that is the day upon which to sell the grain based upon the receiver's market. In fact, some of the agreements call for a deadline upon that sale uh, in spite of, or no matter what the market is doing, the grower is forced, if he hasn't sold grain prior to that time, to sell it on that day. Well, Ray, what would you advise grain growers to do? Growers can either store the grain on the ground, or they can build more bins, or they can sell the grain to the receiver. At least get the receiver's money. Don't give him the grain for nothing. Okay, Ray. Supposing we have a word now about servicing the contracts NFO Grain Department has. Yes, uh, Phil, we'd like to remind all members that to keep our credibility with the buyers, that we have to deliver our grain as early as possible within the contract delivery period. And we've got something less than 5% of the members that are causing us a problem on these contracts. In other words, they're members who either are delivering extremely late within a contract period or are consistently asking us to extend the delivery period with the buyers. It takes us quite a while to establish credibility with any buyer, and then if we have to consistently ask that buyer for extensions or uh, the buyer exercises his prerogative and buys in or cancels a contract, uh, we've just lost that bargaining power we've had with them. In fact, we now have a couple of buyers who refuse to do business with us because of the late delivery situation. In addition to establishing credibility for the buyers in working with the uh, contracts and delivering on time, members should be reminded of the obvious, that the sooner they deliver the grain within the contract period, the sooner they get paid, and that's money in their pocket. I understand you're working on an ambitious project now. Well, Phil, we're just finishing up the test here the last of August on the most ambitious project the department has ever tried. We're feeling very good about it at this point, and we hope to kick it off through the staff and the leadership uh, in the month of September nationwide. What we're doing, in effect, is testing a very special program to seize up two billion or more of the three-year reserve grain from members and non-members alike in an effort to force the general markets up and past the release level. Uh, we're excited about it. It's going to involve tremendous numbers of members and non-members alike. We present Merle Sunken, director of the NFO Hog Division. Merle, the fast food people have been promoting pork, uh, such a thing as a processed like a pork rib. Is this going to bring upward pressure on hog prices? Well, very definitely, Phil, it's had some effect on it, and especially uh, myself, I even like the places where we can get the hamburger with the strips of bacon on top of it. Of course, that's also promoting a lot of pork, and it's not nationwide yet, it's not in all the stores. Uh, but it's very def definitely becoming a, a thing that we're going to be using. I see in the NFO reporter that you're doing business with Frederick and Herod of Detroit, a big independent packer. How's that going? Phil, it's been working just very well. We started with Frederick and Herod uh, on a block contract uh, sometime in the last November. We've been working with them several months now on a very systematic way with uh, producers under contract, with Frederick and Herod under contractual arrangements. It's been a very, very good working situation. How is forward contracting going in national farmers? Well, Phil, the forward contracting, of course, is let off just a little bit, uh, being we have a $60 local market. But forward contracting is in the past, uh, like should be in the future, locking the producers in a cost production plus a reasonable profit and uh, I think it, we don't want to be overzealous about it right here at the present time for the next uh, few days or few weeks. I think in September and October, we very definitely should be looking at the markets for forward contracting in the year of 1983 because uh, this fall there will be a buildup in, in farrowing intentions, uh, which will come about in 1983. So I think 1983 will be a large year for forward contracting. Well, haven't we had low feed grain prices all year long? Why hasn't this caused a buildup already, Merle? One of the biggest reasons that we haven't had a uh, substantial increase in farrowing, for an example, is because the in and outers, as we call them in the hog industry, haven't been able to get in because of the high interest rates when they go to the lending institution because uh, to get in the hog business takes about 11 months before you have any return on your investment. And at 16 to 20% interest 
out there. It just hasn't uh, allowed the uh, new people to get into the hog business. But one thing that we have to remember oh, with this cheap corn out here that we are presently having, uh, we have uh, people raising hogs to a lot heavier weights, which will also put extra tonnage on the market, which we very definitely in the months to come have to be very, very much aware of. Merle Sunken, director of the Hog Division NFO. He noted that there are already signs in the hog market levels that foresee the need again for forward contracting to lock in profits. Here's Ted McCarty, director of operations for the NFO Dairy Department, with a report on the new dairy legislation. The full Senate and House passed the budget bill, which contained cuts to the dairy support program. The bill provides that the support price will remain at 1310 on October 1st. The key provision is the effect of October 1, 1982. There will be a 50 cent per hundred weight assessment on all milk to help the government offset the cost of purchasing butter, powder, and cheese. This will cost the dairy farmers approximately $700 million a year. An additional 50 cent assessment could be implemented on April 1, 1983 if the Secretary estimates that the CCC purchases will exceed 7.5 billion pounds milk equivalent. The current estimate is that CCC will purchase 12.5 billion pounds beginning October 1st. If this additional 50 cent assessment is implemented, the Secretary is required to establish a producer production base and a plan to refund all or a portion of the additional 50 cents to those dairymen who reduce their production below their base. There are various base forming periods, and the Secretary has the authority to select the one he desires. It will most probably be calculated on the amount of milk produced between October 1, 1981 and September 30, 1982. This is a devastating bill for dairy farmers. It will encourage processors to, to store their product with a substantial savings while the dairy farmers pick up the tab. All dairy farmers should express their concern over the passage of this bill to their senators and representatives. Also, dairymen should demand an investigation as to why the secretary refuses to sell CCC pro dairy products to exporters at competitive world market prices as he is directed to do by the 1981 Farm Bill, and why cheese imports have increased 24% and casein imports have doubled. That was Ted McCarty, Director of Operations, NFO Dairy Department. We have presented this month's County Tape Informational Service, compiled and edited by Don Mack, head of the NFO Radio Division. I'm Phil Allen, and that, for this month, is something to think about.